the Muslim believes that that Quran is exactly what Muhammad dictated as the Quran came down. Islam has one, a comprehensive and unchanged scripture. The only system of life in the world that has a comprehensive and unchanged system since it was revealed and is memorized, was memorized in the time of the one whom it was revealed to, has been memorized by millions since that time. I'm going to show you some things that 99.999997% of all Muslims in the world have never seen. Many Muslims make incredible claims about the Quran. This is one from the Turkish billionaire, Fatullah Gulen. He says, the Quran's text is entirely reliable. It's not been altered, edited, or tampered with since it was revealed. All Muslims know only one Quran, perfectly preserved in all its original words. The half reading anywhere in the world today, anywhere you go. This reading we have, we know, it's been preserved even to the dot to the letter, to the bow, to the sound. How are you, sir? Very well, thank you. Great to be with you. You know, we've, we, we thank you for taking the time out to come and share with us the, the, the knowledge and the information that, that uh, you've acquired over the years. You know what? We're going to get right into it. And I, like I said, I appreciate Dr. Bernie is going to be taking us through a PowerPoint presentation. And today, what, t today, what are we going to be focusing on? So the issue that's often raised when, when you start talking with Muslims and you open the Bible with them, they'll say, oh, well, we don't accept that because your Bible has been changed. Whereas as Muslims, we have a, a scripture which has been totally unchanged, uncorrupted throughout history. Or and There's only one Quran and it's always been the same and there's never been any alteration in it. So I'm going to challenge that view today. Most of the speakers and sources I'm using will be Muslim ones. So it's not that people who are critical of Islam who are saying these things, but people within inside the Muslim community who are talking about these things. Well, let's start with uh, the Muslim view of Revelation. So this diagram just shows you what Muslims believe about Revelation. And you can see up here in the, the top left-hand corner, uh, there's the Quran in heaven. And the Muslim belief is that the Quran is actually eternal. So it's always existed alongside Allah. And in fact, it's located on a, a, a tablet in heaven beside the throne of Allah. So uh, this is the kind of reference point of, of the Quran, the starting point. Around 610 AD, the, the angel Gabriel came down from Allah's throne to a man named Muhammad, who was meditating in a cave outside Mecca on Mount Hira, and the angel grabbed Muhammad and squeezed him and said, read, and he was holding a piece of material which had some words written on it. Muhammad said, I can't read, and the angel grabbed him and squeezed him again and said, read, and Muhammad said, I can't read, and then he grabbed him a third time, and, he, and Muhammad said, I thought I was going to die because he was squeezing me so tightly, and then he says, read, and he said, I can't read, and then the angel started reciting the verses from the Quran, Iqra bi ism rabbek, read in the name of your Lord or recite in the name of your Lord. This is in Surah 96, in chapter 96 of the Quran. It's the first verse that was uh, revealed. So the Quran's not in chronological order. And then over the next 23 years until 632 when Muhammad died, the angel would come at different times and re uh, recite things to him and Muhammad would hear them and then he would recite them to his followers. Sometimes they would write them down, sometimes they would memorize them, and that the Quran that we have today is the sum of all of those recitations. And so the Muslim belief is that the Quran that is in heaven is exactly the same as the Quran that we have today. And I have a, a copy here of, of the Quran, and they would say the words when you open this and read it in Arabic, the words there are exactly what is written on that Quran, which is in heaven beside the throne of Allah. So let's be clear about what we're not talking about. We're not talking about English translations of the Quran. There's about 106 of those. As George has said, that often when Muslims challenge us, they'll say, well, do you read the King James Version or the NIV or the RSV? Because they're all different, and they are, but so are all the English translations of the Quran. 
So we're not talking about that. We're only going to be talking today about the Arabic Quran, the, the text that is there in Arabic. When Muslims talk about that, they make uh, some remarkable claims, and you saw some of them in the lead in there. Here's one by uh, Fatullah Gulen, the uh, head of the Gulen Society, a Turkish billionaire. He says, the Quran's text is entirely reliable. It hasn't been altered, edit edited, or tampered with since it was revealed. All Muslims know only one Quran perfectly preserved in its original words since the Prophet's death when revelation ended. Susan, Susan Hanif is an American writer. She said the, the Holy Quran is the only divinely revealed scripture in the history of mankind which has been preserved to the present time in its original form. Jamal Adin Zarabozo said, to this day, one can travel to any part of the world and pick up a copy of the Quran and find it is the same throughout the world. Uh, Abdullah Yusuf Ali, an important translator of the Quran, one of the most popular translation is by this man. He says, so well has the Quran be preser been preserved in memory and in writing that the Arabic text we have today is identical to the text as it was revealed to the prophet. Not even a single letter has yielded to corruption during the passage of the centuries. A book put out uh, by the Abu Dhabi Department of Information says, no other book in the world can match the Quran. The astonishing fact about this book of Allah is it remained unchanged even to a dot over the last 1400 years. Not a variation of text can be found in it. You can check this yourself by, by listening to the recitation of Muslims from different parts of the world. Mulvi Muhammad Ali, he said the Quran is one and no copy, differing in even a diacritical point, and we'll talk about that later, is met with. There have always been contending sex within Islam, but the same Quran is in the possession of one and all. A manuscript with the slightest variation in the text is unknown. al Hajj uh, Ajij Jola uses the, the words of Jesus. He said, the Quran is fully preserved and not a jot or tittle has been changed or left out. So there were eight Muslim writers and scholars from all around the world, by the way, so not all just from one place, some from the Middle East, from Asia, uh, from the West, and all making this same claim that there is only one Quran, there has only ever been one Quran, and that wherever you travel around the world, you will always find exactly the same Quran in the Arabic text. Well, there's one thing wrong with that, uh, is that it's incorrect. You can actually as I do, go on to this website in Jordan. I've been, been along to their shop. I used to live in Jordan. And you can buy 24 different Arabic Qurans. And they've got the different versions. You can see I've circled them there. 24, so 24 different Arabic, Arabic Qurans. Yep. Or you can buy them online. Actually, I just had five bought in the other day. Arrived within a few days and only $5 go. each. So Five dollars the each. <laughs> They're very cheap and good quality, so that's nice. You could also go to a, a store in Lebanon, which has got thirteen different Arabic versions of the Quran, and order them uh, from there. Or you could come to me. This is my collection. In fact, I've got it here behind me on the bookshelf. Here's all of my Arabic Qurans here, going all the way across there, and every single one of them is different. So that's the important thing. Uh, they're not the same. So this claim that people make that the Quran has never been changed, that there's only one Quran, is not correct because we have the material evidence, the physical evidence is here and it's, and it's available relatively easily, all in Arabic. So this is one explanation. This is Dr. Shabir Ali, quite a well-respected Muslim scholar who does a lot of debates with non-Muslims, and he talks about how did this come about. Uh, today, most Muslims read the Quran in a text uh, that uh, is referred to as the Egyptian edition uh, of 1924. That's how scholars uh, refer to it. Most Muslims may not have realized that this is the designation uh, for that uh, manuscript, for, for, for that text to, to, to Muslims in general. This is just simply the Quran. Uh, but this is not the only text of the Quran that is read uh, throughout the world. Uh, in North Africa, 
there is a slightly different text uh, that is uh, based on a slightly different reading, uh, mostly corresponding to what we read in the rest of the world, uh, but with some slight variations that do not affect anything that Muslims believe uh, and do not have any major impact on uh, any Muslim practices. Uh, and then, too, uh, in some parts of Africa, uh, there uh, is another reading of the Quran and a matching manuscript that is uh, prevalent. And here, too, we find some slight variations uh, that do not affect uh, Muslim beliefs uh, and, and do not ex affect Muslim practices in any significant uh, degree. Uh, so how do we make sense of all of this? We want to retrace the history of how these uh, manuscripts became divergent. How is it that we have a variety of uh, readings of the Quran and manuscripts to match, or ra rather even now printed texts? to match. Now today, in, in a Muslim college uh, uh, that, in which um, imams are being trained to serve the community, uh, an, an imam, if he specializes uh, in uh, the recitations of the Quran, he may be taught uh, as many as 10 different recitations of the Quran. And these 10 recitations complement each other. They basically, again, have uh, no effect on the uh, beliefs of Muslims. And uh, they do not affect in any significant degree uh, the uh, practices uh, of Muslims. So we want to get a grip of this. How did all of this come to pass? In the time of the Prophet Muhammad on whom be peace, the most important impetus was to ensure that the message of the Quran uh, would be absorbed and put into practice and taught to others. So the precise words, which, which are the vehicles uh, through which the, the important teachings are being disseminated were not so important. The teachings were important, but the precise words to preserve them uh, were, not, were not of paramount importance. They did not trump the, the, in importance uh, the need for the message of the Quran to be absorbed, uh, to be practiced, and to be taught by others. And in fact, if the Prophet Muhammad, on whom be peace, had insisted on his followers that they should pay uh, due uh, importance to the wording of the Quran to get every letter and sound correctly, uh, then that may have detracted from uh, the focus on getting the message across and implementing that in the lives of the of new Muslims. So with all of the challenges that the community faced in that early phase, it was important for uh, the uh, Muslims to focus on the meaning and the message and to circulate that. So one Muslim would go tell another one, look, uh, we got a new teaching in the form of the Quran. And the other one is asking, what does the Quran say? And then he repeats the saying and the teaching of the Quran uh, without necessarily uh, getting precisely the same words in which they were first delivered by the Prophet Muhammad and whom be peace. So there was this period in which uh, Muslims had the opportunity to teach others the Quran uh, without insisting on the precise words. Muslim scholars have made sense of this by referring to a tradition according to which the Prophet Muhammad on whom be peace said that the Quran has been revealed in seven ahruf. Uh, and I will have to come back and explain that term ahruf. Uh, in any case, uh, that tradition says you can re recite of any of these, uh, whichever is uh, easy for you. And moreover, that each one of them by itself is complete and each one serves as a healing. Now, to use uh, comparable language uh, from our Christian friends, um, we see that sometimes uh, th there is the statement, that which is sufficient for your salvation. So it looks like what this tradition is saying is that if you read according to any one of the readings, then this is sufficient for your salvation. And uh, for, with this in mind, it gives great comfort to the average Muslim knowing that you can read just one of these readings in one text, like, for example, the 1924 uh, Cairo edition of the Quran, and that is sufficient for you as a book of guidance. It is sufficient for you to have salvation, because, again, the various readings do not change anything that uh, Muslims uh, believe and do not affect the practices uh, of Muslims in any significant uh, degree. So uh, it's not like one of these readings is going to tell you that there is only one God, and another reading is going to say, hey, wait a minute, there is another God along with God. No, the central beliefs of Muslims uh, are 
all unaffected uh, by uh, these variety of readings. But now the tradition says that uh, uh, the Quran has been revealed in the seven modes. Now I said uh, ahruf previously, that's an Arabic word, and the singular is harf, which means letter. So it uh, literally means seven letters. But this word could also mean uh, edge. The word harf could mean edge. So maybe it means seven limits. And in fact, Muslim scholars have not been able to define this term with, with any unanimity. And a wide variety of opinions have been given as to what, these, what this term means. What does it mean to say that the Quran has been revealed according to seven edges or seven letters? It may mean, according to some scholars, that the Quran has been revealed according to seven dialects of the Arabic language. So whereas there was today one standard Arabic language, which is called modern standard Arabic, the language that is, uh, is this, the language of textbooks and uh, newspapers and magazines and uh, news broadcasts and so on, that, that being an official language, uh, there will be a wide variety of spoken languages in, in the Arab world. Uh, to the extent that sometimes uh, the people of one region cannot uh, understand the people of another region, though each one understands themselves to be speaking the Arabic language. Something like this may have prevailed even within the lifetime of the Prophet Muhammad and whom be peace. So there were regional dialects of the Arabic language and it looks like the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, may have permitted his companions uh, in the initial phase uh, to recite the Quran in terms of its meaning, uh, to express that meaning in their familiar terms and their modes of expression according to their dialects. The reason that I'm putting these clips in, because this has actually only happened a couple of weeks ago, so for the first time we're getting some mainstream Muslims who are admitting that there have been changes in the text. He said, in Muhammad's time there was no standard version. People conveyed the message that Muhammad had given them in their own words, in their own dialects. Because Muhammad actually talked about the seven ahruf, and he's saying that people don't really know what this word means. It could mean letters, which is funny because it wasn't a written text, or it could mean edges or limits, but some say it could mean dialects as well. So they're the kind of terms that people are, are thinking about and using as they're talking about this. So let's go along and talk about how did so many Arabic Qurans arise? It, none of it came from Muhammad, by the way. Muhammad was illiterate. He never wrote. He couldn't write. So th they actually had to wait until Muhammad died before anyone could write down a complete copy of the Quran. And so in Muhammad's lifetime, there was no complete written copy of the Quran. People did have things that they had written down. They wrote things on stones, on leaves, on camel bones. You can see the picture of one here on the side. And people also memorized bits of the Quran, but it was never a complete version of the Quran which came together during Muhammad's time. Well, how do we know that Muhammad never left a copy of the Quran? After he died, many Muslims who had memorized the Quran or parts of it were killed in a battle at a place called Yamama. And Umar, who was to become the second caliph, said to Abu Bakr, the, the first caliph who replaced Muhammad, he said, I'm afraid that more heavy casualties may take place and a large part of the Quran may be lost. And this was because they didn't have a written copy. The only way they'd get it was to ask somebody who had memorized it. And he said, therefore, I suggest that you order the Quran be collected, that is put down in print. And Abu Bakr said, how will you do something which Allah's apostle did not do? So he said, Muhammad never left a written copy. Why should I make one now? But Umar insisted. And so Abu Bakr calls in Zayd bin Thabit. And he said, you used to write the divine inspiration for Allah's apostle. So he was one of the people who was a, a scribe for Muhammad. He said, so search for the fragmentary scripts of the Quran and collect it into one book. And that meant he needed to go around and find the bits which were written on leaves or stones or bones and uh, put them into one book. Zaid bin Thabit says, how will you do something which Allah's apostle did not do? But Abu Bakr insisted and Zaid said, by Allah, if they had ordered me to shift one of the mountains, it would not have been more difficult than ordering me to collect the Quran. Now, this is an interesting statement because 
according to Muslims, so many people had memorized the Quran so accurately from Muhammad, all it would take is one person who could sit down and recite the Quran to Zaid. But in fact, it took him quite some time to go around and collect all of these different bits and pieces and to put them together into one script. And he did that. He collected all the parts that he could find and he wrote them down in a scroll. And that scroll was given to Hafsa, who was one of Muhammad's, at that time, nine wives who were still alive. And so this is the story about how the first authorised written copy came together. But other people were also collecting their own copies. Zaid bin Thabit wasn't the only one. Others started to make their own copies and to pass them around so that they could teach others. And Anas said, the Quran was collected in the lifetime of the Prophet by four men, all of whom were from the Ansar. And uh, he mentioned Ubay, Mu'adh, Abu Zaid and Zaid bin Thabit. Zaid bin Thabit was, by the way, one of these people who wrote this official copy. And Muhammad said, take the Quran from four, that is, learn it from four people, Abdullah ibn Masud, uh, Salim, Mu'adh, and Ubay bin Kab. Notice that these are two of the same names that are written in the reference above. That's from al-Bukhari, uh, one of the authoritative hadith. So two of the men who were writing their own versions of the Quran were also two of the men that Muhammad said, when you want to learn the Quran, go to these men. So these were the four experts that Muhammad said, you can rely on them to pass the Quran on accurately. But there was a problem. The problem was that the versions that these men were putting together were different. Abdullah ibn Masud, uh, one of those four men, didn't regard the last two surahs or the last two chapters of the Quran, uh, 113 and 114, as surahs of the Quran, and he eliminated these from his copy of the scroll containing the verses of the Quran, and he said, don't mix up with the Quran that which was not of the Quran. These two surahs or these two chapters are not included in the Quran. And he also eliminated the first one, Surah Al-Fatiha, the first chapter of the Quran. He said, this is not in the Quran. This was, uh, along with the other two, these were prayers of Muhammad. These were never revealed to him. And so Abdullah ibn Masud's version of the Quran only had 111 chapters, whereas the current Quran, the Quran that we have today, that I have here, has got 114. So this was a problem. But it gets worse. Abu Musa al-Ashari, again, someone else that Muhammad had recommended as a person to learn the Quran from, added in two extra chapters, Surah al-Khala and Surah al-Haf, which we still have today. And he put them into his version of the Quran. And so his version had 116 chapters. And then another man, Ubay ibn Kaab, who Muhammad had also recommended, added an extra chapter. He combined a hunt, chapters 105 and 106, and so his version had 115 chapters. So we're seeing that the problem is that the Qurans that people are putting together have got different numbers of chapters. But also by this time, Islam was starting to spread. Islam has now moved out of the Arabian Peninsula, out of uh, Medina, where Muhammad's headquarters were, and Muhammad died in 632 AD. And so his armies then spread to different countries around the Middle East. Uh, some moved up to Damascus, some went to Jerusalem, some went to different parts of Iraq. And within 20 years, in fact, 18 years after Muhammad died, these armies had taken over these countries and the teachers of the Quran were teaching the Quran in these places. But notice from the map, you can see these different teachers. And again, these were all authorized by Muhammad had Qurans with different numbers of chapters. They couldn't agree on what was actually in the Quran. And less than 20 years after Muhammad died, there was division about what the Quran should be. Now, this became a problem as the troops were on the border of Armenia. Armies were preparing to go in to occupy that country. And before they went in, they decided they would have a Quran reading session. And so the leader of the troops said, those who follow the reading according to Abdullah ibn Masud go to this side, and those who follow the reading according to Abu Musa go to that side of the mosque. And so they were reading the verses together, but they were reading them differently. 
and they couldn't agree on it would be a bit like someone having the King James version and someone having the NIV version and reading the verses and saying, no, no, that's not what it says, it's different. But these were the Arabic texts which had come from Muhammad and been passed on to these people. And they had different versions. And so a great fight arose between the soldiers and they started yelling at each other. A man who was there, who he went back to the caliph, who was by this time a man called Uthman, and he said, you have to do something about this. We can only have one copy of the Quran. So Uthman compiled a committee of four men, and one of them was this man, Zaid bin Thabit, who'd already written one copy. And he said, I want you to gather all the information and to compile another authorised Quran. And so they did. They gathered all the bits from all the different people, and they had to decide which of the four Qurans, by the way, which bits were going to be left out, which bits would be included in. And then they said, all other copies are to be gathered and to be burned. And so the burn a Quran actually happened less than 20 years after Muhammad died. They, they tried to get every copy that they could that didn't agree with their official copy and to get rid of it. But they weren't successful in that. Not all of the copies were destroyed. And so people actually either hid or they rewrote the verses which had been burned. And so multiple copies continued to circulate. Uh, that's why we got uh, multiple copies, even in these early days. And you can see how that happened. But as to an original text of the Quran, we don't have one. These are comments by a couple of Muslim scholars, Professor uh, Anne-Marie Schimmel, who was a German lady who converted to Islam. She said, no original Quranic text has survived. We don't have anything that was written in Muhammad's time. And this is a comment by Dr. Tayyar Atikulak, um, who is the ex-president of religious affairs in Turkey. He said, unfortunately, there is no reliable information about the first mushafs or the first texts which were apparently destroyed or disappeared as a result of incidents and natural disasters such as wars and fires. He said, this has been one of the greatest weaknesses and pains of the Islamic world throughout history. They do not have an original Quran. We do have some early manuscripts and here's the list of the, the 10 earliest ones. And you can see uh, the top copy one is in Turkey, the one in Cairo is in Egypt. Sana in Yemen has got a couple of them. Istanbul has, has got another one. St. Petersburg in Russia has an early copy. There's three uh, that are in the National Library in France. And one is the Birmingham manuscript, which is in the UK. So there are some early manuscripts, not original ones, but some early ones. When we look at these ones, we can actually see that some of them have got some insertions in the text. And you can see here, this is the original writing there in the brown. And then at different points, the uh, text has had some words put in there. So the original text said, Fa'ina amanu bima amantum bihi, if they believed in which you had believed. But somewhere along the line, someone has added in the words, be mithlihi. These are the, the words here down in, in the bottom. It's in a different colour and it's also got some dots in it and it's got some little strokes which are vowels. The original text doesn't have those. And it's pretty clear that someone has added this in at a later stage because it's a bit like finding a text from uh, 1000 AD and it's got some typewriting in it. You would think that that is an original. So mm -hmm. this is what's happening with this text. And what they've also done is they wanted to try and make this one conform to the standard text and these words were not in the early text by these two men ibn masud and ubay who muhammad said learn the quran from them their versions lack these and so it's been written in so that it fits in with there so it's a bit like going through and rewriting the text uh, here's another one this one is one of the texts that's in turkey in top copy the verse says when allah creates he decrees a matter so um, but in the 15th century, someone added in the words, and you can see them here, uh, circled there, ma yasha, that is, whatever he wills. So Allah creates, indeed, Allah creates whatever he wills. 
And that conforms to the text that we have today. So the Quran that we have today has got those words in it. But this early manuscript didn't have it. And so someone decided that they would fiddle with the text and write in the bits that weren't in there so that it would look like the whole thing had never been changed. But again, you can see this one has got some marks in it and it's also got the dots in it, which weren't in the earliest ones. Another one that we find in the, these early texts, in these uh, 10 earliest ones, uh, this is one in France, they've actually rubbed out a word and it's circled there. Um, originally it said, those are the nearest, uh, but they put in an extra hum in the old text and that's not what's in the modern text. So someone rubbed it out so it, it conforms with the standard text. In some other texts, we see that there's things that have been written over top. Here's one in the National Library of France, Bibliothèque Nationale de France, and the text was rubbed out and they wrote in the words of the modern text because the early text that they had, which has been there for hundreds of years, didn't conform and so they decided that they would change it. And so we see every single one of these 10 earliest manuscripts has multiple corrections. Every one of them has been tampered with in some way. There are 10, sometimes hundreds of corrections in each manuscript. And usually the corrections are to make it conform to the standard text of the Quran, one of the ones that we use today. There's been this effort over history of people making sure that all of the ancient manuscripts fit in with the text that we have today. It's been a rewriting of history in a sense. Now, it's interesting because we can see clearly through the evidence, because that's what we, we're seeing, the Quran that Muslims ascribe to today, instead of going back to the ancient manuscripts and saying, you know what, we need to, that since those are the earliest ones, let's, Let's change the ones we have today to conform to the to what the earliest Muslims believed. They're changing it to what Muslims believe today to changing history, as you said. It's amazing. And, and you know, I don't think most Muslims know this. Most Muslims will tell you that there's only one Quran, that it's yeah. never been changed, mm -hmm. so on and so forth. Yeah, and it, it, I don't know, I, it seems like there's an agenda here. Yes, from. certainly there is. Yeah. And and we'll we'll look a little bit more about that, talk a little bit more about that later on. The, the extent that they've gone to. We're going to move now to another clip. This is the video clip by Dr. Shabir Ali. Now, of course, where we have to explain how uh, did these variety of readings uh, still manifest? Well, the text in which Uthman, on whom be peace, uh, Uthman, may God be pleased with him, had preserved the Quran was written without uh, vowel points and without dots that distinguished between look-alike letters. The text that Uthman prepared could be interpreted, could be read in a variety of ways. And that's one of the reasons why we have, surviving to this day, a variety of recitations, some of which may go back uh, to the time of the Prophet Muhammad on whom be peace. In fact, it is a common Muslim, Muslim belief that we are not allowed to invent anything in the Quran, and uh, it is uh, generally presumed that all of these readings must somehow go back uh, to the early teachers, uh, even those within the lifetime of the Prophet Muhammad on whom be peace, uh, those who heard the Quran directly uh, from the Prophet, peace be upon him, himself, the Messenger of God. So I'll give you a, a quick little Arabic lesson now. I, the Arabic language has 28 letters in it, and you can see that over half of them have got dots either above them or below them. They could be, have one dot or two dots or three dots. And if you remove the dots, then the letters are unclear. You can see like on that top line, there's only actually three letters there, but actually there's seven because with the other ones, you go back and you put the dots in, they, they actually create a different letter, a different sound. So there's actually only seven unambiguous letters in the Arabic language if you remove the dots. All of the other ones could be one or two other possible letters. So it's really quite difficult to read Arabic without the dots. But what's more important is when you put the dots in, it actually changes the meaning. So here's a whole lot of what we call the, the frame or the structure. 
which has got in which has got no dots in it but when we put the dots in and we can put in one dot above one below two above two below or three above that's what we find in the arabic text we get a whole lot of different meanings you can see down the bottom there she built which is bannat and the one at the top which is tabat is she destroyed so you can get the did she build the building or did she destroy the building mm. so you wouldn't be able to tell from the text if you pull the dots out and so it, it becomes really quite ambiguous and unsure and dr shabir ali said you know when you put the dots in of course you'll get different readings and the earliest texts as we saw before don't have any dots in them so this is one of the early texts if you look at it you can see there's no dots in there this is the same text with the dots in it and with this early text i'll often say to an arab person can you read that text for me and they'll say no i can't because it hasn't got any dots i could put the dots in any place and make up a whole lot of different words and so the arabic text in the quran now has got the dots in it so there has been a change that has been at, made at some stage throughout history in that someone or some people went through and put the dots into the text without dots and they made up the words but the problem is they put the dots in different places and i mentioned here my my collection of qurans and the, these are uh, 23 before that i've got here before and i can just pull one out at, at random and what we have done is i've got a whole lot of arab friends and i've done some myself where we've gone through the text and we found where these texts here differ from the standard text the one that i got from the saudi embassy this is called the hafs version hafs an asam and you'll hear about that this is the one that the saudis want to become the standard text and they're a little bit embarrassed by these in fact a couple of years ago a group set up a, a bookstore in in saudi arabia and they had these different versions and when the authorities found out they went and they confiscated all of them they said you cannot wow. have that but these are just as authentic as these ones even they've been passed down from muhammad according to their own descriptions but what's important about them is they vary and so here you can see a verse here because they put the dots in it that says taqulun that is you say and this other version here this this is a version this is the one that's common in saudi arabia this is common in places like algeria and morocco this one says yaqulu and do they say it's the same word but the dots are put in a different place and so it's given a different meaning here's another one a different version duri version is common in sudan i've traveled around the world and as i go into different muslim countries i'll find a bookstore and say what versions of the quran do you have and that's where i got these from i bought six of them in jerusalem went to an islamic bookstore there and the guy had six and i i bought them all um others yeah. i've got from iraq from libya from sudan from yemen these are all countries that i've uh, lived in and worked in uh, from jordan as i mentioned before and again uh, you can see this version here this this is the word kabir which is means big and this is the word kathir this one's got one dot below this one's got three dots above and it changes the meaning of the word here's another one this one here it says uh, there's a day when no intersection will be accepted and this is the word yuqbalu if you know arabic grammar you see that this one here is a feminine noun shafa'a or intercession and so that should be a feminine verb and so it's a grammatical error but in this version another one they've actually corrected that so you've got the correct grammar in this version and you find that in in some of the others as well here's a, another one Again, you can see the same word there. This one's got two dots below. This one's got one dot above, and he uh, says he will expiate you you from some of your sins. That is, Allah will expiate you or wipe away some of your sins. And this version it says, and we will expiate from you some of your sins. That's a big. Uh, that's a serious change of meaning there, because uh, like because it's got to do with dealing with sin. Who's mm -hmm. going to be? who's going to wipe away your sins or who's going to, it actually means to cover up your sins because is it just one person or is it two two or more um we could mean a yeah. whole lot of people and it's interesting in the quran the tent allah is sometimes described as see he sometimes as you sometimes speak, speaks about himself as i and sometimes as we so allah is talking about the trinity there we 
Yes, yeah, that's right. Yeah, folk, the Bible says, you know, let us make men in our image according, according to our likeness. Yeah, so you can see these differences as you go through them. Another one here, this one actually changes the meaning completely. It says, many a prophet fought alongside large uh, bands of men, and the, the word there is katala. And this one here, many a prophet was killed alongside large mm -hmm. bands of men. So it's the same three letters but they put the vowels in different places, and so it gives a completely different meaning. You've got the word parla, which says, he said, by Lord knows what's in there. And here this one says, kul, which means say. It's, it changes this from something that someone did in the past, he said, to a command telling a person to do something either now or in the future. Mm. So you've got all of these variations. And as I've uh, uh, gone through the Qurans, we're finding an average of 100 to 150 consonantal differences, so changing it, the letter from a T to a Y or a B to an N, and about 5,000 vowel differences per version. So, But you can see each one of these markers tells you a, of a, a consonantal difference. We didn't bother marking the vowel differences because they're too many. You would find an average of one difference for every verse of the Quran. There's only 6,000 verses in the Quran. So these are significantly different versions. And again, I've got 23 of them. Muslim writers say that there actually have been 50 of them that have existed. Some are no longer around. They've just passed away with time. So this really becomes a problem, and so Muslims are now starting to deal with this. And I'm going to show you another comment uh, by a man. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Yasir Qadi. Again, this only came out a couple of weeks ago. He's a very well-respected Muslim scholar. He runs an Islamic institute in the United States, and he's being interviewed by Muhammad Hijab, who's a British Muslim. Uh, what is your position in relation to? preservation of Qur'an is, for example, Hafsa and Asim, the way Hafsa and Asim, do you see it as preserved munazzal from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Or do you not see that as munazzal? What's your Jayid, position? Jayid. Okay, so uh, first and foremost, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, inna nahnu nazal dhikra wa inna lahu lahafidun. So we yeah. believe as a matter of theology, as a matter of aqeed, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has preserved the Qur'an, no question about it. Every single student of knowledge knows who studies ulum al-Qur'an that the most difficult topics are ahruf and qiraat and the concept of ahruf and the reality of ahruf and the relationship of the Uthmanic Mus'haf with the ahruf and the preservation of the ahruf. Is it one? Is it three? Is it seven? And the relationship of the qiraat to the ahruf. This is a topic that when you're the beginning, beginning student of knowledge, you're like, what is all of this going on here? When you go a little bit more, you learn to simply memorize what your teachers say and regurgitate it out. And you don't fully comprehend. When you do a deep dive is when things get very, very awkward and difficult. And this isn't new. This is from the time of the Sahaba in the Sahih or the Hassan Hadith of Ubay bin Ka'b, the Hadith of the Ahruf, that when the Prophet mentioned the issue of Ahruf and that there are different Ahruf and whatnot, this is in the version of Muslim Imam Ahmad, Ubay bin Ka'b says, authentic Hadith, فَدَخَلَ فِي نَفْسِي شَكْ In my heart, a doubt came that I hadn't had about Islam since the days of Jahiliyyah. This is not a joke, brothers and sisters. The issue of Ahruf and Qiraat caused confusion to somebody whom the Prophet said, if you want to listen to the Quran directly, listen to Ubay. Ubay is not some even average Sahabi. He is the Qari of the Quran. He is the master. He is who he is. And he goes, فَدَخَلْ فِي نَفْسِي شَكْ like, What is all of this stuff? And the Prophet, and the Prophet put, it, yeah. put his hand and then he goes, uh, it all went away. Yeah, me and you, yeah. we don't have that blessing, do we? These are very, very difficult issues. And the most advanced of our scholars, they're not quite fully certain how to solve all of the unanswered yeah. questions in there. Ibn al-Jazari, who without a doubt is the greatest scholar of Qiraat for the last thousand years. Ibn al-Jazari yeah. famously writes, I have been Bible thinking and pondering. Oh yes, Bible tradition. I've been thinking mm -hmm. and pondering about the issue of the ahruf and qiraat for over thirty-five years. Nathan with Latina Sana, he said, right? And yeah. confused and whatnot. Then finally, this is my response. And by the way, seven, and by the way, even that yeah. seven, 
all later scholars say, well, that doesn't make any sense. So they kind of dismissed even that. After 35 years, the greatest scholar of Qiraat... Some, some accepted you know, it. Some accepted it. It some, doesn't answer the I've question. Seen, I've seen some, okay. Anyway, I don't want to get yeah. into that issue. Okay, fine. Why fine. do I not want to get to that issue? Here's the point. These issues should only be discussed amongst people mm. who know what the Qiraat are and who understand yeah. some of these questions that are being... And by the way, this is now a well-known open secret amongst many Muslim graduate students and, and, and academics around the world. And yeah. this is well-known. Traditional understandings of Ahruf and Qiraat cannot answer some of these pressing questions that are now being poked by our uh, people outside of, by our academics, not our, by their academics outside of the faith tradition. You see, in a Muslim environment, there's always some respect that we have for the Quran. We should. In a Muslim environment, we'll press a little bit and then we'll say, okay, khalas, sami'na wa ta'na. And that's great, alhamdulillah. When you go to academia, they don't have that red line. And they're going to just, you know, the, 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 the famous story of the emperor with no clothes. They're going to just point out, no, that doesn't make any sense. Well, that's not true. And this and that. And they'll bring issues, which I'm not going to mention explicitly, that you know are true because they're in your own books. They're not inventing anything new. They'll bring you riwayat and they'll bring you athar. And then you add to that very well-known issues of, I don't even want to be explicit. And then you bring on top of that makhtutat. And then and then. And it's very clear to you and to every single very advanced student and specialist that the standard narrative has holes in it. That's what I'm going to say. The standard narrative does not answer some very pressing questions. Okay? This is what I'm going to say. By and large, our ulama in the Eastern world are not aware, by and large, of what's going on in the Western side of things. And they're not answering those questions in a manner that it needs to be answered. And this is something all of us that are in academia fully acknowledge. This issue uh, of Ahruf and Qiraat has troubled the Ummah from the very beginning of time. It's nothing new. And there are 15 opinions about this. None of them fully answer all of the questions that are raised. Some of them answer more than others. So the issues of the relationship, of the origins, of the ikhtilaf and all of this should only be discussed amongst those who are familiar with this science. I can't answer this question in a 20-minute interview, nor is yeah, it wise yeah, yeah. to do so, which is why I never brought this topic up myself. You will not find one lecture of mine about this issue. It should never be brought up in public. And I don't like these idiots, and they are idiots, wallahi, because they're the ones who caused this. In this issue, they're utter idiots who did something haram. And I don't like saying this. This is not something you discuss amongst the masses, ya akhi. It's not wise. You don't understand qiraat. Let it be. Yasser al Qadi, he was in a, a group, a closed group of academics who were discussing these issues, thinking that no one else could hear what they were saying. One of them disagreed with him, so they posted all of the information up onto the internet. And so he's been forced now to respond to it. Whereas he's saying, I didn't particularly want to do this. I don't bring this up in public, but now we have to talk about it. And he mentioned that this problem troubled the Muslim community from the very beginning. These were seven books that were written by early Muslims about the discrepancies in the Quranic manuscripts. And they were compiled by a guy called Abi Yaqud Nadim in 987. So remember, Muhammad died in 633. So this was about 300 years. But these were all books that were written before that. And so you've got discrepancies between the manuscripts by al Qasai, discrepancies of the manuscripts by Khalaf. Some of these guys, al Qasai and Khalaf and Abu Dawood, Isfahani, are also people who have compiled some of these. And they realised that even when they were writing the Quran or putting the Quran down, that other people had different versions of it. We'll look at, look at a few of those. So that's been talked about from... The previous millennia, it's, it wasn't something that's just come up in the last hundred years or dozen years. It's been around for a very long time. There's the, the Birmingham manuscript, which got a bit of publicity a, a couple of years ago when they dis decided that this was probably the earliest text that we have of the Quran. A couple of things to note about it. It's only two pages long. So that's, that's the sum total of it. It's not as though it's a whole Quran. In fact, this was the one that I showed before, which people said they can't read. It hasn't got any dots in it or any vowel markings. It was carbon dated, and they said the dating is somewhere between 568 AD to 645. Now, remember, Muhammad died in 632, and they said this is with 95% accuracy. The wider out you go, the, the 
more accurately you come. But if you, you want to say, was this written in Muhammad's lifetime, then the accuracy will decrease. But in fact, it only dates the skin. It's written on parchment, which is like animal skin, so very soft leather because the uh, paper wasn't available at that time. And it just tells you when the animal actually died. The ink and the writing come from a later period. But the earliest date is actually pre-Muhammad. Muhammad wasn't born until 570 AD. So they're saying that this could have been actually written before Muhammad was even born or while he was still a child. And it may have been verses which Muhammad borrowed from someone else. So what appears to be convincing evidence has got a whole lot of things that need to be talked about. More exciting was the discovery in uh, 1972 in the great mosque in Sana'a. And I used to live in Sana'a and been to this mosque many times. They found in the roof of it over a thousand ancient Qurans. Muslims have such a respect for the Quran that they won't destroy it when it gets old. They'll put it in a safe place. And they had stuffed these into a little attic in the ceiling and they were doing some renovations. And these bags came out. I think there were 40 kind of big bags full of, of uh, manuscripts. And among them were a thousand ancient Qurans from the end of the 7th century to the beginning of the 8th century. So the late 600s, Muhammad died 632. So these were from, say, 690 to 720. And these are probably the earliest manuscripts, and some of them were in that list of uh, the 10 earlier ones that I have. Now, what's important about these is one of them, which is called the Blue Quran, has a thing which we call a palimpsest, which means that there was a text which was written on and then washed away and written over top of it. Because it was done on animal skins and animal skins were relatively expensive, when the writing became a bit faint, they would just wash it off and then write over top of it so that they wouldn't throw away the animal skin so it wouldn't be wasted. But we can actually use ultraviolet photography or lighting and read what was written under the lower text. A bit like you, you might pick up a bit of paper, something's been written on top of it, and you, if you hold it in the light the right way, you can actually read what was written on the paper above it. So the imprint was still there. They also found that the upper and the lower text had both been corrected. We saw before how verses had been changed. That's happened with both of these. So we actually get four texts of the Quran out of this one palimpsest, which is pretty exciting. So we find there were verses which were not found in today's texts, and presumably they were removed at some time. These are comparisons between today's standard texts, this uh, one, the Hafs uh, Asim text, which uh, the Saudis provide, and text in Sana. And you can see here, this is the word Jehannam, which means hell. The one below, you see it's a completely different word. All the others are the same or approximately the same without the dots. This is probably the word for fire and nar. At some stage, someone decided we, we, we should put in a different word, and so they wrote in the word Jehannam. You have another one here, Yahlefun, they avow, and that was changed down here to Yaksimun, they swear. Someone's changed the word at a different point. And we found many of these. Here's another one. You've got a word here at the top, which uh, we've got the word Allah written in the Sana text, but that's been removed in the text we have today. Another one here. Again, other written there being removed because uh, maybe it didn't rhyme enough or they didn't think it was necessary, but at some stage someone has removed these words. And then a last one. Here we've got words which in the today's text, we find the equivalent one in the Sana text and those words are not there. So at some stage, these words were added in by someone and the blue words were you can see here this is the word wa which means an and this is the word inna indeed has been changed and sometimes whole verses are missing from the early text which suggests they were added in at a later stage so these texts have been around for a very long time and i mentioned there were 10 early ones there's been a whole lot of others since then and muslims have been aware of this and talking about it and so what have they done in 650 AD, so only 20 years after Muhammad died, Uthman decided that he would burn all of the variant texts. And so he did. They had a big bonfire and it was written on leaves and bones and, and bits of rock and they burnt them all to destroy them. 
But in 1924, the Egyptian government in their education department, when they were trying to teach the Quran to students, they said, we need to have only one Quran. So the Quran that we will accept is this one, which is the Huff's version. And they then gathered all of the other versions and they dumped them in the Nile. That was in 1924. And since that time, this has become the standard version. It was a bit like the King James Version 50 mm. years ago. It was the standard version. There were other versions around, but everyone read the King James. So they're now trying to make this one the standard version and to try and get rid of all of these other ones. But it's going to need a, a rewriting of history to do that. So when they talk about the seven readings, it does raise the problem of I've got 23 different Qurans here. So which, which are the seven, if that is what the, the seven readings means, which are the seven ones which are accurate? Every one of them claims to have come from Muhammad. So which are the ones which should be burnt? Which are the ones would the Egyptians take and dump in the Nile? In fact, they would dump all of them in apart from, from this Perhaps. one. This is the only one that they would keep. So it's become a real problem for them, and Muslims are only now starting to talk about it. In this last video clip, I'm going to show you what Dr. Yasser Qadi's response to this is when Muhammad Hijab says, well, knowing all this stuff, and Yasser Qadi said, we've known about this for a long time, you're taught about this in theological school. He says, which one would you use? To try and make this as specific as possible, I think. If I were to give you a blank mushaf, yeah, and, uh, and tell you to write what is munazzal verbatim from Allah into that mushaf with no human interference, would you write something which corresponds? It's with not an easy answer. It's not an easy yes or no. It is enough for the Muslim to believe I think Quran this should be an Muhammad. easy yes or no, though. Yes, Al Khadi. I, I hey, have to. Be okay, very, very well. So, yeah, Muhammad, after we get off this phone call, me and you, let's have a number of discussions. No problem. I'm very yeah. open with advanced students. But what, said, what would you write? Uh, 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 let's you not. Write? Let, let's. You, you're pushing me, and I'm saying it's not hikmah to listen. I have a condition. Like I said, everything I say is going to be factual. The Quran is the uncreated speech of Allah. The Quran is preserved. The Quran is known. The Quran is mutawatir. And alhamdulillah, all of the qiraat are the Quran. All of the qiraat are authentic. Alhamdulillah. Leave it at that, ya Beyond this, honestly, I have no problem. We'll have discussions or take my class. As you, as you know, I spend a lot of time with Sheikh Akram. Yeah? And we had these conversations about the, the qiraat. Like for, for many years, I would say many years, I've had these conversations with him. His view is that, okay, the Qur'an is not mutawatir. It's very, he made that public. It's not something which is it's on his YouTube uh, page. I think what I'm, that's fine. For, for many years, many people have said that. Even though I completely, I vehemently disagree with the idea that the Qur'an, the, 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 the things are not mutawatir. But many people for many years, if you look at the early times you had of, I don't know, Tabari or whatever, it's, it's clear that the question of tawatir was not, it was not always a straightforward one. If, if, if someone gave you a Qur'an which is empty in terms of there's, no, there's nothing on it and gave you a pen, obviously you're half of the Qur'an uh, with the Qur'at. Obviously you can, you can do isti'ana with what's maktub. But the question is, would what you write in that mushaf correspond with any... I'm not saying it's a mutawatir. I'm saying would it, would it be sahih, authentic? Would it correspond with anything that we have in terms of the riwayat and the Qur'at? Is if... If the answer is no, then for all intents and purposes, what you could be uh, portrayed as saying is that you have a view which is not only completely anti-normative, but is, 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 is beyond the scope of uh, what was written for 1,400 years. So someone will no, say if then... You're, if, if it's beyond the scope, no, no, okay, who's going to bring a new Quran? We're going to have the Quran yeah. there, but which Quran will it be in? It'll be probably a mixture, right? It's not going to be That's necessarily... Fine. Yeah, okay, so let's leave it at that then. It's, gonna, it's not going to be the exact Hafsa and Asim bi riwayati Fulan or Shu'ba. This is something that is coming at a later stage, okay? okay. The codification of the Qiraat is coming in the second, third century of the, uh, of the Hijrah. But you would Just have like something which you could say is, is Sahih. Re fully recognizable by the average Muslim, obviously. <laughs> There's a problem here. The problem is very simple. Yani, yeah. are you certain that that's the way that it was in early Medina? Because just like the codification occurred. But what you would have, let me put it this way, would definitely be something the average Muslim recognizes and understands and will not... And all of it is verbatim from Allah. 
هكذا this is in the hadith يا أخي it's exactly هكذا أنزل it's literally what the Prophet ﷺ said هكذا أنزل it's literally what he said and that's and again this is it might not be a standard حفص عن عاصم exactly exactly but, yes but, yes but what you write recognizable. down will be is recognizable and you believe and you believe that everything within that is منزل من الله سبحانه وتعالى 100% as Allah is my witness 100% that is the belief yes. That's that's very clear. The earliest yeah. scholars of Qiraat fully understood this. But what happened was a, sw a switch in the 6th, 7th century, which kind of then ossified the tradition. But secondly, very grateful for your openness and honesty. And I feel like the Thamarat that have come from this is going to be uh, something of benefit for so many people. So you can see here, he has gone to a position where he says, if I was asked to write a Quran, I would draw on all of the bits from these different Qara'at, these different 23 that, that I have here and some others that I haven't been able to get hold of yet. And he said that it would not correspond exactly to this version because it would have bits from one and bits from the other. But if you think about that, it actually means it would look nothing like any Quran that we have on earth. And I use the example of a fruit salad. Once you chop up an orange and put it into a fruit salad with an apple or with a banana or whatever, the result is no longer an orange. It's something which is completely different from all of the parts that went in. So the big question for Muslims is, if this is the Quran, the one that he suggests is the, is the Quran, which is in heaven besides Allah, and we talked about that one, the, the one which is beside the throne, then all through the centuries, people have been reading Qurans which have got a mixture of correctness and a mixture of incorrectness because they're not all the same. He claims that they all came from Allah. So Allah is speaking with many tongues um, if he's not giving one single definitive version of the Quran. When we go right back to the beginning, we said that these Muslim scholars, and I cited eight of them, who said that not a dot has been changed. We've seen that that is clearly false. All of the evidence shows that even from the earliest time, Muhammad's followers could not agree on the Quran. As soon as he died, they were coming out with different versions of the Quran. And these were people that Muhammad said, if you want to learn the Quran, go and talk to this person or that person. And if they did, they would come up with different versions. So we're not exactly sure which version that Muhammad recited. He said it can be recited in seven Ahruf, whatever that means, whether it's letters or edges or dialects, but we're not sure which one was his. And so when they tried to put it together, they had to destroy a whole lot of the information. From a Christian perspective, we try to save all of our manuscripts so that we can constantly improve. But for yes. Muslims, it was the, the, the reverse. They actually destroyed all the early evidence. And one of those actually may have been the correct one or even more correct than the one that they've got today, but we'll never know because we can't go back and check that. We saw that the 10 earliest manuscripts that we have all differ from each other and they've all been tampered with. So at some stage, people have gone through and tried to rewrite them. And so the Qurans that we have today have all gone through a series of changes. And these versions that I have here, all of them, by the way, have all got stamps in them saying that this is an authentic Quran. None of them is you know, some guy who's decided to print this in his backyard, every one of them has come through a, a publisher and been authenticated, but they're all different. And so when Muslims say to you, the Quran has not been changed, you can say, I'm sorry. There's a whole lot of evidence that we have, both from history, from Islamic sources, from Islamic scholars, and material evidence that we can have a look at today that show that that's not true. The Quran definitely has been changed. Appreciate you coming on. You know, I hope you have a good weekend. Let's stay safe. I'm sure we'll see you again soon. So thank you, right. sir. I look forward to that. Blessings and, to you. Uh, blessings to you, sir. Uh, blessings to everybody out there. Uh, we'll see you next week. God bless everybody, and we'll see you next time. Okay. Bye-bye.